there's an area called managed futures. It's the worst name ever because it <laughs> sounds complicated and scary. Um, but but managed futures, when you look at it over time, we think is as good of a complement to stocks and bonds as you can possibly find. And so you get these very, very diversified portfolios uh, that historically over time have tended to really march to the beat of their own drum. So they are they have no what statistical measures correlation. They have no correlation to either stocks or bonds. And these strategies tend to do the best when you need it the most. So they went up a lot in 2022. Average hedge fund went up 20%. Um, even after all hedge fund fees, uh, they went up in the, during the great financial crisis. They went up during the dot-com crisis. So those two characteristics, what has no correlation to stocks and bonds and what also does well and needs the most, I think you know, if you look across how to handle the world over the next 20 years or 10 or 20 years, I think this will become not, you know, it, it, it will become essential, not optional as an allocation. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. When I graduated from Stanford Business School 20 years ago, a classmate announced that he was going to go work for a hedge fund. And the rest of us asked, what's that? Fast forward two and a half decades and the financial markets are practically overrun by hedge funds, collectively managing over $5 trillion. And while certain hedge fund managers have become financial celebrities through dazzling returns in their best years, the industry is generally better regarded as a modern version of Wall Street doing what it does best, lining its pockets at the expense of others. Is this accurate? Or are there benefits the hedge fund model offers to markets and perhaps even to the little guy? To find out, we're fortunate to talk today with Andrew Beer, co-founder and managing member of DBI, which seeks to put the strategies behind successful hedge funds into the hands of the retail investor. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Adam. It's great to be here. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, first time I'm, I'm making your acquaintance and obviously having you here on the channel. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, really looking forward to sort of demystifying hedge funds for folks here and to see if there's any any value, any strategies there that that the the regular retail investors, which are the folks that watch this channel for the most part, can use to their advantage going forward. Um, before we dig into the hedge fund part, though, um, I'd like to ask you the question I ask all my guests here right at the start of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? So well, I guess I guess a couple things. I actually wrote some commentary last year that the economy and the markets reminded me a little bit like a drunk stumbling across the highway. <laughs> in that, in that, you know, he's he's kind of he makes it into the first lane, and then you see this eighteen wheeler coming down, barreling down on him, and you kind of close, clench your eyes shut because you think, oh my god, you know, this is going to flatten him, and then you open your eyes, the dust clears, and he's still stumbling forward, and this happens five or six times. Um, you know, so to me, the remarkable thing since. Uh, since the Fed started hiking rates and we have war in Europe and you have all of these very, 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 you know, we get political, borderline political chaos. And your banking unrest. crisis. I mean, oh my yeah, God, we've got, I mean, we've got, I mean, it's, we have had a, a potpourri of bombs go off and yet somehow the economy has remained largely unscathed from all the shrapnel. Um, and, and I think at some point, you know, in the context of that, we've also had this huge wild card, which is AI came out of nowhere. You know, and it was like an overnight industry, third or fourth, whatever, however many industrial revolutions. And so it's just, it's very weird because when you take a step back and you look at the budget deficit and all of these and the macroeconomic environment, it 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 should feel very scary. And yet that doesn't seem to be reflected in equity prices, uh, as I think we'll talk about a little bit. You know, bonds, um, uh, just as a general category, have had a terrible decade. And and so, you know, what does all of this mean for somebody who's trying to build portfolios to navigate the next 10 years? Because it just seems like it's going to be a lot harder than it was in, you know, in the 2010s in particular. OK, and, and I think we're going to get into this in a bit. I, I know from just having looked at some of your, your writings, um, one of the questions that sounds like you've been asking of late is, is the 60-40 model, um, is that outdated? Uh, is it time for something different? So um, you're nodding as I'm saying this, but, but we'll, we'll we'll save that for once we, we get into the meat of the discussions here. Um, all right. I like this sort of stumbling drunk analogy. Yeah. And it's almost <laughs> like halfway across the, the freeway here. 
um, you know, AI put like an Iron Man suit uh, on him, yeah, which which allowed him to, to to go a lot, you know, withstand a lot more uh, injuries than they otherwise might have been able to. Um, when, when we talk about the markets side of things, um, and, and I'm just asking you for your gut call here. This isn't this isn't a prediction and anyone's going to hold you to. But but do you think the drunk's going to make it across the street okay, or do you think that there is a reckoning here um, that will eventually have to be dealt with? There's, there's definitely reckoning. I mean, some reckoning is coming. I mean, the 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 irritating thing about reckonings is they don't advance. They don't tell you in advance. You know, right. something comes out of nowhere. Uh, I mean, look, look at March 13th of last year when Silicon Valley Bank blew up. Right. And then we go from that to two weeks later, the whole regional banking system is about to collapse. <laughs> like <laughs> Lending is going to stop across the United States. And then Credit Suisse is going to come down. We're going to have a global banking, banking crisis. And about three weeks later, they're like, oh, never mind. We're back. Um, so uh, so something will happen. It'll probably be, um, you know, it's going to be something like look at COVID. Right. I mean, in COVID hits, the first reaction among a lot of sophisticated investors was it's a bad flu. And and then all of a sudden, and nobody had on their spectrum, wait, what if the global economy just voluntarily shuts down for some period of time? And uh, and then, you know, then everybody's becoming expert on all of these terms and, and you know, the same things happened with, so every time you have one of these events, there's this kind of mad scramble to figure out what it is and what it means and what's the terminology. So the most likely thing is also the one that's most unpredictable is that it's going to be something we have no idea and it comes out of nowhere. And then we're going to be trying to figure out what, you know, an EMP pulse does when it lands in London or something. I mean, it's going to be something horrible. Well, you're echoing every week on this channel. I do a weekly market recap um, with one of uh, the financial advisors that are endorsed by Thoughtful Money, a guy named Lance Roberts. And uh, and he very much beats that drum, which he says, look, he, he's not, he doesn't know what it's going to be. Uh, he says, nobody knows what it's going to be. The one thing we know is it's something that is not currently on the radar. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right. It's the no, it's the unknown knowns or the unknown unknowns or something, you know, whatever, whatever that expression is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So let's, let's trundle into the main question of this discussion, um, which is all around hedge funds. And, and why don't we just start with the most general question of all, which is exactly is a hedge fund, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the people watching this, they certainly probably know the term. Some may have a little more familiarity with the model than others, but I think the average person probably doesn't feel like they fully understand exactly what differentiates a hedge fund and, and what exactly it does. Sure. So, so hedge fund, it's it's a great question. It's in, and we could do multiple uh, uh, of these just trying to actually answer that question. But basically a hedge fund, the history of hedge funds was that you go back to, and the industry really started to become a thing in the 1990s. Before that, it was very much of a, you know, very, very, you know, sort of quiet little niche industry. By the way, back to your story, I, I graduated, graduated from Harvard Business School in 1994, and I was on the path to become a private equity guy. And two of my professors came up to me and said, you know, hey, we want to meet you this, I want, we want you to meet this guy named Seth Farman. He's hiring uh, uh, for his firm. And I said, what does he do? And he said, well, he runs a hedge fund. We know that because we put them into business. And, and I said, exact same question, what's a hedge fund? Um, <laughs> so I, I uh, you know, unlike, unlike you, I ended up in the industry um, also almost somewhat by accident. Um, but really what hedge funds were supposed to do were to do uh, things that other investors couldn't do. You know, that they were supposed to, like if you are a great stock picker and you go work for Fidelity picking stocks, you've got a hammer and you've got to find stocks to buy. Right. If if all stocks are expensive, you don't want to own any stocks. Just as a business matter, you in your typical mandate cannot go and bet on all these stocks going down. You know, you may lighten up on some of certain stocks in one kind or another. So, so one of the great issues that investors have is when you have a mandate, you become constrained by that mandate. And so the whole idea of hedge funds was, you know, let's just kind of turn really smart people loose to walk into the office in the morning. And say, so how do I make money? And and that ranges the very broad range of things because the different ways people can do that, you know, is just is is only bounded by the creativity of people trying to do that. So when you hear about you know George Soros breaking the British pound, that's an example of a hedge fund betting that the British pound would break uh, and or would would go down in the early 1990s. The subprime crisis again, a completely different thing. But again, and and what but what the common element of all of this is that most investors are not set up to do it. So the whole idea is if you take a really smart guy, almost like you take a, 
uh, you know, a, a, a great mixed martial artist and you throw him into the ring with guys who can only kick or only punch or something, he's going to be able to find a lot more opportunities and things to do. And so the original idea back in the 1990s when I joined was there were a lot of things that the, the average investor wasn't doing. There were a lot of, you know, so you look at a trade and, and you'd find, you know, well, Fidelity can't do that for the following reasons. These smart guys can't do it for us. And so there was this whole kind of world of opportunities of great trades. And so in the 1990s, hedge funds did really well. They kept finding these things in these areas to make money. Now, they, now what made them different from mutual funds was that because of the flexibility of the mandate, uh, they tended to be set up as partnerships. And, and under US laws, if you have a, a partnership, you've got to meet certain accreditation requirements. You get these mm -hmm. annoying K-1s every year. It's illiquid. You don't get your money back on time. And, and so during the 1990s, this business really grew up from these very, very high net worth guys who would meet some super smart guy or talk to their friend on the golf course who would tell them about some super smart guy, they'd get the money. And one of the characteristics of it is we want them to be, you know, we don't want them to sleep. We want them to think every moment of every waking hour, we're trying to find the next great opportunity. So we'll not only pay you a management fee, we'll pay you 20% of the profits. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna and that's gonna fire you up to go into the office and find the next big thing. And by the way, we expect you to invest when you make that money. We expect you to invest it alongside of us. So that was the original version of hedge funds. And then the version right. of hedge sorry, funds. Sorry to interrupt, but that's yeah. that's where the two and twenty saying came from, right? You get right. essentially a two percent management fee, and then you get twenty percent of the profits. Right. 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 And 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 where that came from is most of these things were small, right? This was a very the, when I joined this firm, Valpo's, they had about 600 million in AUMs. 10, 15 years later, they have 30 billion in AUMs, right? So, so what you can do with 600 million, and it was a large hedge fund at the time, is totally different than what you can do with 30 billion. You know, you can't have your smartest guy right. finding the best opportunity where you can put $20 million into it. So that was the original idea of hedge funds. And like a lot of things in the asset management industry, what you have today is the Frankenstein version of it, basically, that... that this idea that was built for these niche markets and niche opportunities with guys who were sorry, going back to the two and 20, you know, the idea was, well, we'll pay a high management fee because the guy's only managing $50 million. And, and that allows him to find the things that the guy who's managing my money at Fidelity or American funds or whatever would never be able to find or never be able to invest in those opportunities. And, um, and so, and then we'll give them 20% of the profits because we want them to be motivated to leave a mutual fund or other place in order to in order to seize on this opportunity. We want them to be entrepreneurs. So this rich fee structure was designed for smaller funds that could be nimble, find really esoteric opportunities. And what's happened today is that it's become basically an industry of a fee structure. So mm -hmm. you've got multi, multi, multi-billion dollar funds and the industry keeps evolving and changing. Um, but by and large, the original people who loved hedge funds in the 1990s would never touch 95% of hedge funds as they as they exist today. Because it it became this weird asset class where institutional investors started piling money into it after the great opportunities were gone. And so, you know, in 2016, uh, I wrote an editorial for the Financial Times basically saying, look, if you invest in a typical hedge fund, 80% of the value goes to them, not you. But you bear 100% of the risk. So in a lot of ways, I've been a very, very big critic of, of, of the broad hedge fund industry. People are now, there's a lot of negativity about hedge funds now. They're kind of catching up to where I was about 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hey, is, is there like an adverse selection with hedge funds, um, uh, sort of like the way that there is in venture capital, where um, the field is dominated by a few really big firms. And so if there's a good opportunity, it tends to knock on their doors first and they'll take it if it's good. Right. And so you have all the other VC firms that are, they're kind of competing, you know, for the scraps and mm -hmm. therefore investors in those VC firms are probably not going to get phenomenal returns because all the phenomenal return opportunities were, were snapped up by the, the big guys at the start. Um, is it sort of like that now that the hedge funds have, have proliferated so much that, uh, they can't all have phenomenal, you know, they're not all finding phenomenal opportunities. So I, I think the, I mean, if you look at the broad hedge fund industry, 
um, you would be better off not investing in probably 90% or more of them. There are, there are always a handful of funds that are incredible. Um, and they're usually doing something different and they're run not just by great investors, but by, by great businessmen. And so there are these funds out there that you may have read about called multi-strategy hedge funds. I mean, those are, those are nothing like the hedge funds of old. These are, you know, huge financial money-making, you know, perpetual money-making machines. Um, and they do things like that, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a part of Wall Street that lends money to hedge funds, you'll lend more to them at a cheaper rate than you're going to do it to anybody else because right. of their of, of their position in the market. But and their consistent but look, the big, track record. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I mean, if if you're if you're only concerned about returns, um, you know, there's an expression in the industry that size is the enemy of performance. Mm -hmm. Most strategies look great when you're small, and again, if you've got 50 hedge funds out there. And 10 years later, a handful of them, whether just by flipping coins or, or scale, are going to look much better than everybody else. Most of the other ones will be gone. And so if you walk into the room at that time and say, oh, look at these five hedge funds. They all did incredibly well. You've, you've, it's as though you're looking at the five guys who are standing with 45 bloody bodies on the ground and saying, oh, you know, not a bad fight. You know? Right, right. It's, it's survivor <laughs> bias. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me ask this question. It's a little bit orthogonal, but... Um but it's it sticks in my mind and it may be sticking in the minds of some of the viewers here. So the way you describe hedge funds originally, right? So mm -hmm. let's let's go back to the late 90s, right? Um, it's basically wealthy investors, you know, very high net worth investors, um, you know, getting these top, the, the top talent coming up with a, you know, really compelling incentive structure for that talent to not sleep and look for the, the best stuff. And as you said, um, that that hedge fund manager was able to do stuff, particularly back at that time, that that the competition couldn't, right? And this is sort of like you know, in the kingdom of the blind, uh, one-eyed man is king, right? Like this is a guy who just has this advantage over everybody else. And so we all, as as retail investors, you know, sort of sort of feel that the rich just have better opportunities to make money than we do. Um, this, I think, is a is a good example. And of course, the de defense at that point in time was, well, you can't have regular people putting their money into these hedge funds because it's super risky. We don't know what's going to happen and we, we don't want them to lose money they can't afford. So only wealthy people can put their money in here. Right. Um, but of course, that just means that to the extent there is a real advantage there, it's the wealthy that are the only ones that are benefiting from it. So let me just ask you this. Is it fair? At the end of the day, is this is this is this something that that gives the wealthy an unfair advantage and just sort of continues to let the rich get richer here, or has the model evolved since then where um, it's 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 not just a benefit for the wealthy that the others don't get a chance to access? So, a lot of the smartest family office investors, those original investors, have been out of hedge funds for a long time. The, the the big money going into the hedge funds is the retail investor through their pension plans. <laughs> so so pension plans okay. throw money at these hedge funds, at the, at the biggest hedge funds. Look, some of the hedge funds charge 6, 8, 10% a year. I mean, staggering amounts of money. And there is some guy sitting in a pension plan somewhere deciding that it's a good idea to give that guy who may have done incredibly well over the past decade, but is going to have a really hard time overcoming those fees on a long-term basis, particularly yeah, now that they've so much. Sorry to interrupt, but I want you to include this in your answer, which is, sure. well, is it some guy at a hedge fund thinking this is a good idea, or is it some, sorry, at a pension fund, or is it some guy at a pension fund who has been aggressively sold by that hedge fund that, hey, buddy, I'm the Wall Street guy, this is what you need to do? Oh, look, it's a con. So, so the, the hedge fund industry, there's a uh, collusion is a kind of aggressive word, right? But there is a, 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 a symbiosis between these very, very expensive products and a lot of people who control money in some way, shape or form. So for instance, there is an industry of what are called institutional consultants. Now, institutional consultants are the ones who advise those pension plans on including hedge funds, private equity, and other things. They compete with each other to come up with the most complicated, most sophisticated sounding portfolios, because that helps them to land business with an ex-pension plan. 
Is that ultimately, at the end of the day, what's the best thing for the pension plan? I think it's very debatable. I think there are people who think that, but but they don't have a huge incentive. A consultant firm doesn't have a huge incentive to say, you know, the best thing is just put it all into the S&P 500 and don't look at it because we can get that for free. And we've got 500 guys who are running these companies, like Warren Buffett said, walk into the office every day trying to figure out how to boost their stock prices and do better. But if you if if that's their recommendation, you don't really need them. But if their recommendation is to do a lot of these complicated things, well, you sure you sure need them. And you know you'll probably pay them more for the advice. Um, in a lot of wealth management platforms, depending upon where your money is managed, they won't let the hedge funds come in and talk about what they do unless you cut them in on your on their profits. <laughs> so mm. so it's it's a it's not just the hedge funds versus investors. It's hedge funds. Asset managers, consulting firms. I look the, the greatest hurdle we faced as a business because we can talk about it. Like our whole thing was, we think a, a handful of hedge fund strategies are great. There's one that we think is terrific, but you know what? We can copy it really cheaply, and by copying it cheaply, we can deliver it to a broader range of investors and do better over time. Right? That's our basic our basic idea. The problem is we don't have money to sprinkle around to people, so a lot of the the the, the gatekeepers of capital have been very resistant to us because there's no there's no sharing there's no it's it's okay so let me dig into this because I, 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 that's really interesting um and i think i think that's at the heart of kind of the mission of what you you try to do here which is um you know i've just taken a couple of swings at the hedge fund industry and and you've kindly taken the blows and sort of said yeah you know some of these are are, are kind of right but um it sounds like there's still benefit in the model. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it sounds like there are hedge fund models, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there, there are hedge fund strategies or, or, or models that that still can de deliver superior returns. Right now, those are still kind of um, protect, you know, they, they remain in the world of um, the hedge fund industry as it is, largely getting uh, the benefits from, from deep pocketed buyers, whether it's a family office, whether it's a pension fund, whatever. Um, what you're saying is, is hey, uh, that's, that, that's not, um, it's not an uncrackable code. In fact, we kind of know the code uh, and we can replicate that in a way that the, the, the retail investor, the little guy can actually enjoy those same benefits. Uh, we just need to scale. And right now the industry is is resistant to that, obviously, because they, in many ways, I imagine, um, they don't want to give up their unfair advantage here. Uh, and, and also too, just, you know, generally, I think, um, you know, in, in investors like to give money when they see money already being given. So maybe you're just at the stage where you haven't hit critical mass yet. But, but anyways, it sounds like, did I describe it right in the sense that you're trying to kind of, you know, uh, take the formula of Coke and, sure. and, and share it with the world? Yeah, no, exactly. So we're, so we're, we're starting, it's really a two-step thing, right? One is we say, what do hedge funds do that we think is intrinsically really valuable? And then two, can we copy it cheaply as or replicate as the technical term and deliver it to a broader audience? Now, the one thing that I, that I, that I would say to your audience is, um, you know, is, is the, the asset management industry is built to have lots of products outstanding at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I always describe it as like, um, uh, like five-year-olds playing soccer. Like when there's one product, when there's one ball that goes in the direction that people like it's going up or something then everyone chases it. And so what happens is, is, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of products out there. The one that's doing well, you'll hear about. Mm -hmm. Now it could be a fluke, right? They could have gotten lucky. They could have been in the right place at the right time. Lightning struck, you know, once or twice for them, but, but the, the products themselves. So there is an area for the past 15 years, people there, there's something called the liquid alternatives world, which is a terrible expression, but what basically means is let's take hedge fund strategies and put them in, into mutual funds and make them available to a broader audience under the guise of democratization. Okay. Those products have made democratization a four letter word for a lot of people because the average fee structure on those is less than hedge funds, but still about 200 basis points a year, 2% a year. And guess what the return has been over the past 10 years? 1.7%. Okay. So actual hedge funds, I've done 5.7% over the past 10 years. 
which is less than equity is an awful lot better than bond. So you can actually make a case for that. The average one that they show up and, and tell you about has done 400 basis points less than that, 75% less than that. It's 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 an embarrassment. And so, so part of what we're doing is saying, you know, not only do we want to find what hedge funds do and deliver it in a way where we can do even better than what the hedge funds do, but also just to try to clean up this industry that has hundreds and hundreds of products that literally going back to it, it wasn't that 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 Wall Street made money or the hedge funds made money. It's that these asset management firms launched products, got paid, clients took all the risk, didn't make any money, and 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 they wonder why people are dissatisfied with the space. Got it. And, and I just have to put this up here because uh, I think uh, the visual just captures what you're talking about so wonderfully. And I'm sure you've seen this. Um, Bloomberg Business Week cover, Andrew, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it captures it so well. Yeah, exactly. They're out there beating their chests about how wonderful the model is. But for for many, many uh, of the funds out there, the returns have been uh, disappointedly flaccid, let's say. Um, yeah. All right. But OK, so you said um, very simple. Understand. I totally get it. Uh, hey, despite all that, there are some elements, some core elements uh, in, in the hedge fund uh, approach uh, that are, um, you know, successful at delivering um, excess returns. So everybody likes excess returns, right? Um, just talk about what, what are they? What, what are the elements that you think are worth replication? Sure. So, so my favorite area, right, the one that I spend 90% plus of my time on, is um, is a strategy that has it's this fascinating paradox. It's the so when when we look at a strategy, we say you can it's easy to buy stocks, it's easy to buy bonds. Whether you're a 60 40 portfolio or an 80 20 or 30 70, whatever the number, whatever it is, you know there's been the proliferation of products, compression of fees, all these things have been wonderful for retail investors. You can buy things now you couldn't have imagined buying 30 or 40 years ago. Right. Um, and so what 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 is out there that we think will will, will complement that? Now, one of the big things that, that that one of the big seismic shifts that 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 we talked about a little bit earlier is is stocks and bonds just having that traditional 60 40 portfolio worked perfectly for 20 years. 2000 through 2020, bonds were the so bonds were the perfect diversifier to equities. They had great returns they never went down they had very low volatility um they had that whenever stocks would 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 go down they would go up i mean it was just it was right. you didn't need they, they maintain else. their negative correlation they maintain their negative correlation maximum drawdown is 3.8 percent you know volatility was three percent it was just it, you almost couldn't go wrong this was of course a great multi-decade bull market in bonds that's now been reversing so now this decade everything's gone off the rails right you've had no returns in bonds You've had a 17% maximum drawdown. Um, you correlation's gone positive to equities. So everybody's struggling with, with, you know, what do we want as a diversifier? What and and why do you want to diversify in the first place? Is because everyone's goal, I think, is you want to see how how do I grow my money as much as I can, whether it's my advisor doing it or me doing it, doing it for myself, and be able to sleep at night. And and the sleep at night part of it is hard, right? You could put all your money into cash. And you can sleep at night, but you're going to be eroded by inflation and you're going to be a lot poorer in 20 years than you would otherwise be. You can put it all into equities. You'll have a lot of money if you can not look at it and you can withstand 20, 40, 50% drawdowns along the way. So, so the challenge is, is what do I put in the portfolio that helps to balance out these other things? In other words, like creating not from this, this two-legged stool, but creating a third leg of the stool. So the, there's an area called managed futures. It's the worst name ever because it sounds complicated and scary. Um, but but managed futures, when you look at it over time, we think is as good of a complement to stocks and bonds as you can possibly find. Uh, that And the reason we got interested in it, because it also happens to be an area that's easy to replicate. And so we pioneered a way of basically saying, hey, there are great guys who are already in the space. Let's figure out how they're investing. And then we'll try to do it much more efficiently, much more cheaply, and put it into an ETF in the US, put it into the equivalent kind of products in Europe, and use it in portfolios. So take the, take one of the, what we think is the most valuable hedge fund strategies, and then make it available as, as broadly as possible. 
Okay, um, so maybe I missed it, but what exactly is a managed future? Ah, okay, so so managed futures is a, um, I'll tell you the technical side of it, and then I'll tell you why I don't think that's even terribly useful as a description. Okay, so the technical side of it is that there are guys who have PhDs and are very quantitative, who look at all of these different markets in the world. Futures contracts are basically these very, very, um, it, very easy ways of betting on gold going up or down. Like when you hear about gold going up or down, you're usually talking about a futures contract on gold. Or when they talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the yen, the dollar is appreciating versus another currency. These are generally done through what they think is called futures contracts. And, and these guys love these things because they're very easy to buy and sell. They're very liquid all the time. And so what they do is they basically build these computer models that are always asking the same kind of question. If gold has been going up for the past two or three months, is it likely to keep going up? And how do we decide whether it's likely to be, keep going up? If it's going down, is it likely to keep going down? And futures allow them to basically bet on things going up and bet things going down. And they do it across the world. So they do it in, in, in equities. They do it in rates like treasuries. They do it in uh, commodities. So gold and oil, things like that. And they do it in currencies. And so you get these very, very diversified portfolios uh, that historically over time have tended to really march to the beat of their own drum. So they are they have no what statistical measures correlation. They have no correlation to either stocks or bonds. And these strategies tend to do the best when you need it the most. So they went up a lot in 2022. Average hedge fund went up 20%. Um, even after all hedge fund fees, uh, they went up in the, during the great financial crisis. They went up during the dot-com crisis. So those two characteristics, what has no correlation to stocks and bonds and what also does well and needs the most, I think you know, if you look across how to handle the world over the next 20 years or 10 or 20 years, I think this will become not, you know, it, it, it will become essential, not optional as an allocation. This, wow. however, is not how I talk to people about the space when I'm trying to describe it to them, which I'm happy to, 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 to tell you about as well. Okay, sure. But, but essentially what I'm taking from this is um, it, it's almost like a new asset class that you're describing. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing um, much of it is, is more you know, sort of hard assets, commodities, currencies, whatever, which sort of explains why it's perhaps really not that correlated with stocks and bonds. Um, but you get, sounds like you're, you're, you're getting sort of hedge fund like returns. Mm -hmm. If this is well managed, um, you're getting, um, important diversification in your portfolio. So maybe this is, you know, what you're saying, okay, 60, 40, maybe isn't the right model anymore. I'm going to guess you're going to say it's some stocks, some bonds, and then, you know, manage futures or manage futures as part of some other, you know, alts category that gets tacked onto that. Uh, you're, you're, you're nodding as I'm saying all this. Um, so am I am I following your breadcrumbs correctly here? Yeah. So so look, sixty forty as a as a concept, right? Is 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 in a grinding migration to something that's going to look more like 50, 30, 20. And and the two drivers of it are really that equity valuations are very very high right now, and unless AI keeps pulling, as you say, keeps pulling you know rabbits out of the hat, we're likely to have diminished equity returns over the coming decade. And bond returns in higher interest rate environments tend to be not terrific on, on an inflation adjusted basis. And so, uh, and with stocks and bonds moving in tandem, you've got, you've lost a lot of your natural diversification. So, so every person I know who builds model portfolios is thinking, what else do we need to add to that? And I, I think it's going to go from 60, 40 to 50, 30, 20 over time. And the 20 will have a mix. You know, if you are at a, large wealth management firm, you'll have a private equity component, a private credit component, uh, infrastructure REITs, you'll have a, a bunch of different things that are going to that 20. Um, in your, if you're in the ETF world, where we principally are, uh, there aren't many other options. So I think more of that, but I think, you know, I think in general, I think three to 5% of that 20% will be managed futures. Okay. So, um, so, uh, this is really interesting, and, and I love to have these type of discussions where I'm, I'm hopefully putting something on the radar of the audience here that that they didn't know about before, so that interested investors can go, you know, investigate the potential of this and say, hey, maybe this might be something I might want to consider adding to my portfolio at some point in time. So, if somebody <clears throat> wants to get exposure 
to manage futures in their portfolio. Is the ETF model the best way to do it right now? And have you actually replicated this in a, in a low cost ETF for folks? So we, we, we manage an ETF. We sub-advise an ETF called DBMF, uh, which is the largest, it's about a billion, bit over a billion dollars. It's the largest right. ETF in the space. Sorry, is that the ticker or just the name of it? Oh, t- ticker. Sorry, every in ETF land, everybody refers to everything by ticker. So, um, so everyone refers to it as DBMF, um, which stands for Dynamic Beta R Firm and then Beta Futures. Um, uh, and uh, but there are also a number of very very high quality mutual funds that do this as well. Um, and so there are. This is an area where, but so. We did an analysis of this whole world of hedge funds over the past five years, because we just passed our five-year track record with this ETF. And what we found was that managed futures just tended to add a lot more value to people's portfolios than than, than the vast majority of other you know, great sounding hedge fund-like products uh, in mm-hmm. mutual fund land. And so um, the reason we did it as an ETF is because historically, uh, well, we like the ethos of the ETF world, right? The ETF world uh, in in mutual funds, you know, platforms still get paid more money. So if a higher cost mutual fund might do better on a platform because there's more money to share. Um, the ETF world has been just a very, very fiduciary investor friendly world, trying to make things as efficient as possible. It just has had very, very, very few options outside of good options out for real diversifiers. And so we set out to, we wanted to prove that we could do that in the ETF world. Now, doing what we do, we can do it equally well in a mutual fund or an ETF, uh, but we thought uh, the simplicity of what we do tends to favor doing it in an ETF over a mutual fund. Okay. Um, and just help me sort of understand the the economic structure. So we talked about kind of old fashioned private equity, two and 20, sounds like the 2% has ratcheted up to crazy levels in in certain funds in the modern era. Um, If someone were to invest the ETF way, what what, what are they paying? So so in the ETF that we manage, it's 85 basis points is the management fee that's all in. So there's no 20, basically. There's no incentives in it. Uh, And and the mutual funds tend to be, they're more legacy products. They tend to average about 170 basis points. So it's, 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 and a typical hedge fund, you know, given ups and downs in the 20% might be 300 basis points over time. So it's meaningfully less expensive than hedge funds and it's less expensive than mutual funds. Now, one of the very good questions is why do you care about something being less expensive, right? Because people who sell expensive products will always tell you, don't buy that because it's cheap and will underperform because we've got all this, you know, this super secret sauce and that's why we should pay us more for this product. And, and right. uh, our argument is you want it cheaper because I'll pass on those to you, right? If, if I can do what they're doing and do it more cheaply, I'll just deliver. In other words, if they make 10 and their clients get six after fees, if I can get 10 and pass nine to you, you're better off. Right. So it's so and, so so and, fee, and presumably fee the world will beat their path to your door because it's just a, just right. a better solution. Fee reduction is about doing right, structured the right way. Fee reduction is about doing right by your clients. All right. So you know I love solutions like this. Um, what is the performance differential between the successful hedge funds that are doing similar managed future stuff? Is it is it pretty identical? Is it only eighty percent is good? What, what are you finding? So I, I always run into issues in terms of how much I can say um, as a as a, of a of a publicly traded fund. Um, what I can tell you is that we're aiming to do to beat them by three hundred basis points a year without taking on more risk. Okay, that's so huge. That, right? Then I got to ask this question. So yeah. yeah, even if you're just in the realm of close to them, forget about mm-hmm. beating them consistently, being much more uh, cheap. Uh, you know, much better value for the investor. Um, and I imagine much more liquid, right? I can just trade in and out of the ETF. Yeah, and you can buy $25 if you want. Yeah, okay. Right. So do you live in New York? I see the New York skyline behind you. Right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a cool graphic. I live uh, uh, in, in uh, Connecticut now. You yeah. live in Connecticut, okay. Yeah. But, but uh, let's just assume you're traveling to New York on business. Um, mm-hmm. How much do you worry about, you, you know, somebody shoving you in front of the subway there because you're you're basically giving away for, a, 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 you know, the, the secret sauce, basically? 
Oh, so you know, it's very funny. So I mean, there used to be a running joke. So actually, I live near Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, and we're moving our offices to Greenwich, Connecticut, um, uh, for for a variety of reasons. But the uh, there used to be this running joke because I was a long term. I was basically I'd been a thorn in the side of the hedge fund industry for a long time, not just writing like these things in the FT and calling out the issues with it. So the running joke used to be if if uh, if your car breaks down in if Andrew's car breaks down in in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, call hostage rescue. It's a trap. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, within this space, I mean, to me, what's remarkable about this space, and I, I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about the experience of owning it, because I think it's a little bit different from the technical explanation of it. Um, but mm -hmm. to me, the, the amazing thing about this space, a great asset class, a great strategy, is one that becomes commoditized and accessible over time, and is just as valuable as it was when it was a niche area, right? We started out by talking about hedge funds as though you love the guy when he manages 50 million because he's finding all these esoteric things that the big boys can't find. And he's, and that's translating into better returns for you. And, and, and then as he gets big, he just kind of looks like everybody else. Right. right. So what I love about this space is it's been on a 30 year path to commoditization. And I don't mean getting less valuable, right? This is a space that went up 20% in 2022 when both stocks and bonds were down after it was already accessible to people in mutual funds, in, our, in the ETFs that we manage and other, a few handful of other ETFs that are out there. Because, you know, when people look at, in the eight, 19, 1980s, for instance, you know, the, the idea of like high yield bonds was, was a new area. They were junk bonds. It was Drexel. It was like, there was this kind of like shady veneer about the whole thing. Right. And, but the returns if you were willing to go in that space, the returns were great. Yet here we are 30 or 40 years later, now it's high yield, right? It's not high yield and high defaults, right? It sounds, and right. people just use it in their portfolio. They don't question it, but think how much better and more accessible it is now than it was back then. And so and so, I think managed futures will be one of the hot asset classes of the 2020s because in the same way that because of the value that it adds, but it's also one of the few things that you can make work for a broader audience. You can make it work in an ETF. Like, the, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole idea of an ETF outperforming famous flagship hedge funds on a regular basis, yet having the accessibility of it, yet, having, yet not having all the accreditation requirements, yet not having K-1s and all these other issues associated with it. That to me is revolutionary. And that's why people have called us like the, the you know, we we're trying to be the vanguard of hedge funds. We are trying to bring this thing that we think is very, very valuable, but bring it in a way that 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 investors can use in whatever de way they deem to be appropriate in their portfolios. All right. Well, um, the folks who watch this channel know that an important part of its mission is is trying to trying to help level the playing field um between uh you know, basically Wall Street and, and, and Main Street investors. Um, and uh, information asymmetry is a huge part of that, um, but also solution set. Uh, and, and you're definitely, it sounds like part of the movement to give the little guy, um, you know, some of the, so, some new clubs in his, in his golf bag that historically have only been, uh, you know, uh, in, in the purview of Wall Street. So I'm a huge fan of, of movements like this. So um, a big kudos to you and, and, and the folks you work with to, to make this happen. Um, super fascinating. Um, Andrew, we're going to have to have you on again to, to dive more deeply into this. Um, uh, and, and folks, if you've enjoyed this, please let me know your feedback in the comment section below. Um, as we start to wrap up here, um, key super question, which is, so where can folks learn more about, about you and your work? And if they're interested in learning more about managed futures ETFs, where can they go? Well, well, first of all, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so please do reach out. I post things regularly on LinkedIn, but our firm has a website. Um, it's dbi.co. There's no M at the end. Uh, the one with the M at the end was too expensive because it's a David's <laughs> bridal. Um, but we do get, we have dbi.co. Um, and and we, that's where we publish. And you can see if you're interested in in funds and things, you can get links to it. It's again, we're the sub advisor to these funds. Um, but that's where we also published thought pieces and content. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but but look, that's it. I mean, we're trying to basically, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that that we didn't cover is, you know, why should you feel good about having this in your portfolio? 
And uh, I'm sorry, do you, do you mind if I like give you like two minutes on why I think? Give me however many minutes you think you need okay. to explain on that point. Because I, I think what happens is when you talk about managed futures the way it is, it sounds scary and people's heads freak out. And, and I think it's, it's a problem with the space hedge funds, they like to sell complexity. And so if I can, if you'll just give me like a few minutes, just explain how I talk about this to my sister. No, sure, please. I mean, I'll okay. say you, you already had me at, um, you know, uh, uh, excess returns, um, you know, uh, better, uh, you know, m much better economics uh, to me, uh, no position requirements, okay. uh, n negative correlations with stock, <laughs> or no correlation okay. with stock and bonds. But but yeah, please give me the give me the regular person elevator pitch. Okay. So, you know, so when, when I talk about this space, um, I talk about it very differently than most people in the space. Most people in the space are, as I mentioned, they're quants, they're engineers, they like talking to other quants. Um, the most instructive conversation I had about, about this was with my sister, who was not financially sophisticated. And, and I was trying to explain managed futures and, and, and about 25 minutes into it, she said, I just have this question, what's an ETF, right? And, and you know, she... It's just not her world and language mm -hmm. the world. And, and when I said to her about this, I said, look, in the 90 minutes before we started talking about this, all we were talking about were scary things in this world, right? It's, 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 it's anxious talking about the macroeconomic environment, the, the mm -hmm. geopolitical environment, et cetera. And most of what we do on the investment side, as, as we, we talked about is just kind of putting it out of our, our heads. Like, like we can't, we can't build a portfolio today worrying about a dirty bomb going off in a major metropolitan area. So you just assume it's not going to happen and hope for the best. But as we've seen, things happen that are scary and we spend all of our time. It creates more anxiety worrying about what's this going to do is what if inflation comes back even harder than it is? What does it do to you know gas prices and, and, and all of these things? And so the way I think about this is this will never be half your portfolio and it shouldn't be. But but you should have a small percentage of your portfolio that's worrying about the world, trying to find opportunities in, 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 in this chaos, which is what these guys do, um, so that you can worry a little bit less about it. And that's why I think that's why when you end up looking at a portfolio and you say, hey, I've got 5% in this, it shouldn't be I've got 5% and therefore that helps you know my efficient frontier and my expected sharp ratio is gonna go up over time. It should be, I feel good because I've got a certain amount of my own money in this thing that if we do hit, you know, if inflation does suddenly spike back to 10%, if there's a war in the Middle East, if there are these things that that where, where, where the chaos in the world takes off from here to be betting that there are people who are walking into the office every day trying to figure out those things are really scary, but maybe there's also a way to make money in it. And so... That to me is the power of the strategy. You've got your stocks, you've got your bonds, and then you've got things like this that help to reduce, like, because I've called like money is bottled anxiety and it gets much worse. We worry about hmm. a 20% drawdown for an average investor is very different than a 20% drawdown for a pension plan. And so, you know, how do we help people to be more calm in their portfolios? And that's having something in there that's worrying about a portion of it for them. All right. Um, it's a very understandable explanation and actually one that I think um, it, it's very complimentary for this audience here, um, Andrew, because one, uh, we do probably more than certainly most other mainstream financial channels, um, you know, spend a lot of time talking about the potential risks that are out there. And, and as I sort of, I think said in my intro, um, a, a disproportionate number of the guests that have come on in the past couple of months are just being very transparent with how nervous they are right now, given you know, these current macro conditions that you're talking about. Um, and a number of them uh, end up saying, hey, you know, you should have some, you know, assets like precious metals in your portfolio, largely playing, you know, a similar role to what you're talking about, right? So this is just yet another, we'll say, club in the bag that you Absolutely. can put alongside a precious metals position or a cryptocurrency position or whatever. Um, uh, you know, we also spend a lot of time reminding people as long as the world works the way that it is, sitting 100% in one of those asset classes probably isn't the right thing to do. I mean, just from a diversification standpoint. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but like your you're saying, <laughs> yeah. But, but if it sounds like this, for, for people that are inclined to want to have some of that type of asset in their portfolio, this is yet another one that they can consider. 
Absolutely. And that's what I say. I mean, it's it's commodities plus this, plus if you believe in crypto or or you think it's going to be, um, uh, you know, have some of that. Uh, there are certain ETFs and other things out there that are designed to do well if inflation goes off in some unexpected way. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of it, it's the point is diversification is is critical um, uh, to sleep at night through a market cycle. And, and diversification means doing things that are really different than the stuff that we have. It's not going from Microsoft to Apple. It's doing something quite different. And that and that uh, I, I think that I think we're going to see a lot more of that over the next 10 years. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, um, I will, when I edit this, I will put up the links to your website and whatnot. I'll also put up again here, the link to the ticker of your ETF, DBMF. Um, for folks that want to just learn more about managed futures in general, what would you recommend they do? Just a standard Google search? Or are there any of the resources that are out there that explain them well? Um, I would read, uh, I would do a Google search and then uh, and then watch podcasts like this because the Google searches will tell you, you'll get academic sounding papers on it, which will will tell you the theory and everything behind it. Um, I think it's the practice of it that's more interesting. Okay. All right. Um, well, look, uh, Andrew, it's it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you here. I, I, I'm going to have to thank the gentleman that put us together. Um, again, uh, I'd love to have you back on the channel. I'm sure we're going to get lots of comments here um, about folks' level of interest in this. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. And, and um, I, I know there are a few other topics that, that you like to talk about, too, that we didn't have a chance to get into in this one. So hopefully, maybe we can be back on later in the summer to do that. It would be, it'd be an absolute pleasure. Adam, thank you very much. All right, everybody else, thanks so much for watching.